Um, if you have any questions, then please type them in the uh, question and answer box, which is just at the bottom of your screen there. Um, and we'll be looking at the questions at the end of the webinar. So don't worry if we're not saying it when you've typed it in, we're watching what's going on. And also captions are available. Um, so if you just follow, we'll just give a, a couple of seconds for people just to make sure they've got um, the Zoom's room controller, tap the CC icon, and you might need to look for the three dots um, to be able to see that icon. So let's just give a couple of minutes for people to get the captions working. Or a couple of seconds, a couple more seconds maybe. Lovely, and hopefully that's working well. Okay, thank you. So um, we're gonna keep that up so that people are joining, they can see how to, they can see how to do that. So, hello, uh, welcome to our webinar and it's NF2 day. Uh, and it's really great to have you here. My name is Claire Goddard and I lead the UK arm of NF2 by Solutions. And if you haven't met me before, I'm involved because my husband and two children have NF2. Um, this webinar will be recorded, so you'll be able to find it again if you want to recap on something or in case you miss it. And that will be on our YouTube channel and you can find that through our website as well. Everything, all our webinars are listed on our website. So it's really good to get onto the website and have a look at all of the work we're doing. So also um, with work, have you seen our latest newsletter? So hopefully that's come into your inboxes the last couple of days. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, packed with really great info and um, all of your work supporting us um, as we search for a cure or preventative treatment for NF2. So together, we've certainly been very busy. And if you'd like to stay in touch with us, then um, please just type in the chat box, stay in touch. That's all you have to put. And um, we can get back to you with some more information if there's a part of this webinar that you'd like to chat to us about on a one-to-one. -one. We're really open to that. So please do, please get in touch. We're one big family. So today we've got an um, exciting hour ahead. Uh, we've got the Vice President of NF2 Biosolutions, Gilles Aitlin is here. He's going to talk about our NF2 Day fundraiser and research projects globally. Next, we have Olivia Goddard, our NF2 Young Adults Ambassador. Olivia leads chats with young adults aged 30, 18 to 30, encouraging them to advocate for themselves um, to provide support and also encouragement. Uh, well, after that, we'll hear from Grace Gregory and Adam Jones, who are 18 months into their NF2 by Solutions funded PhD in Manchester in the UK. Um, the team there are looking at the role of inflammation in NF2 tumours. So that's really important work. So it's going to be very, very interesting to hear how they're getting on with this today. It's very exciting to hear from them. Great to have that insight into the research centres as well. So we'll follow that, as I said, with some questions. So do put some in the chat and do communicate with us. So let's crack on. And it's my pleasure to introduce Gilles Aitlin, uh, Vice President of NF2 by Solutions. Over to you, Gilles. Thank you, Claire. Hello, everybody. Uh, as Claire mentioned, it, today is May 22nd and it's NF2 day. Why 22nd? Because this is a chromosome 22 where we have the mutation. And um, we would like to to uh, present you the current fundraiser that we're doing for today and for the next few days. Uh, as you know, we jump started a very important um, research at Nationwide Children Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. It's a gene therapy research where we add an NF2 functioning gene uh, into the cells in order to restore the creation of the protein, uh, the protein myelin that is missing in the NF2 patients that is mutated. So, this uh, project is moving forward. Uh, we did the drug discovery, the preclinical development, where it has been so many different constructs has been uh, designed and tested on cell lines and animal models. And now we are feeling confident that we have enough data in order to start to present our work to the FDA in order for 
have preparing a trial. But before we prepare the trial, we have to have the first interaction with the FDA and pre present our data. And uh, this is a, a work that takes usually uh, two months with the with the hiring of uh, private consultants that knows exactly how the data should be presented uh, to the FDA. So that's why we are raising funds today for this uh, phase. Uh, we have a anonymous donor, uh, a foundation that uh, it's a family that is connected that has a, a patient touched by NF2 that um, that are donating twenty five thousand dollar for matching for matching. So it means if you donate one dollar, your dollar will be doubled up. Uh, and so that's very important for for us to fundraise for this money so we can move forward with this project and uh, keep him going because this is really the hope that we are all waiting for. Uh, I, I didn't say to you at the beginning, my, I'm the dad of uh, Karen, she's 15 years old. She has an F2, she was diagnosed when she was six years old. She got many surgeries and uh, that's why I'm uh, deeply involved in, uh, in fighting for finding a cure. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and I hope you will enjoy this this webinar and then listen to this the wonderful work that Greg, Grace and Adam did. I had the pleasure to meet them in Manchester and in, uh, in Los Angeles and they are very, very involved in NF2 and uh, I'm very really happy to present them to you and I hope they will be fighting for NF, against NF2 for uh, many years but not too many years because we want to end NF2 totally. Okay, <laughs> so Please, uh, Claire, uh, I give you back the mic. Absolutely. Thank you, Gilles. Yeah, we're very excited, but we're going to keep you waiting a bit longer uh, before we hear from uh, Grace and yeah. Adam. So next up, we have Olivia Goddard. Um, she's our NF2 Young Adults Ambassador. So she's here to tell us about um, the transition from a child to a young adult whilst managing the condition and how important that is, and more importantly, um, mental health, because that's a big step for people that have NF2 as a child, and then they have to manage the condition themselves. So it's a really, really important role. So over to you, Olivia. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Olivia Goddard. I am the UK Ambassador of Young Adults for NF2 Biosolutions UK and Europe. In my teenage years, I had three major surgeries, one of which led to blindness in my right eye, a CSF leak, and lots of mental scars. I have faced PTSD, anxiety, and depression as a result of these operations. NF2 is not just a physical battle, it's a mental one too. Young adults that have to endure these traumatic operations and live with the fear and unpredictability of NF2 is a tough pill to swallow and can cause a lot of mental damage. My aim in this role is to build a community of young adults and create a safe space for people to feel comfortable opening up about their mental health and how they're feeling. To build friendships with people from around the world so that people know they're not alone in this roller coaster of a journey that is NF2. NF2 is so rare, it's sometimes hard not to think that you're the only one having these worries and feelings. Even if people don't feel comfortable speaking, it can be such a big help to hear stories that are similar to yours and know that there are other people out there that are going through something similar. I have created a group on Facebook. We have a general chat where everyone can support each other in day-to-day -day life. We also have monthly Zoom chats for anyone who would like to join. These have been ongoing for about a year now, and it has been so inspiring getting to know people from all around the world. The group is growing and growing, along with connections, friendships, support and advice. Only a few months ago, we had a lovely girl join the group. She mentioned that she has NF, but hasn't had a scan for years. She said that she feels really anxious all the time, throwing up constantly and isn't sure why. Her doctors were saying that it's likely to be stomach related, ulcers or something along those lines. In the call, we suggested she push for an MRI just to rule out NF2, which is exactly what she did. She advocated for herself, got an MRI and was told that she has a massive tumor swallowing her adrenal gland, which is why she was feeling so anxious and had all these horrible side effects. Shortly after she had an operation to remove said tumor and a few weeks later, she now feels better than ever. 
On the build up to the op, she came on all of the Zoom chats, expressed how she was feeling towards it. And only two days after she had the surgery, she was still in hospital and she joined the Zoom chat just to let us all know how it went and she was okay. An amazing story, an amazing girl. And that's exactly what this community we're building is all about. If you or anyone you know who is 18 or over would like to be part of this amazing growing community, please get in touch with me. We would love to have you. On another note, NFT Biosolutions UK is working with the Littlest Tumor Foundation and the Childhood Tumor Trust to put, put on an online webinar on the 30th of July. This webinar is to empower, inspire and motivate young adults with NF. We have a panel of inspirational young adults telling their stories of advocating for themselves, facing up to challenges and not letting NF2 overpower their life. There will be tips on self-care and mental well-being, along with a motivational speaker and research updates. The link to sign up is in the chat. Please come along if you're free and help us build on this fantastic community of NF fighters. Thank you all very much for being here. My name is Olivia Goddard and I'm an NF2 fighter. Thank you, Olivia. That's very powerful stuff. Um, don't forget, anybody that wants to stay in touch with us, if you know young people, you have family, you have friends with NF2 within this age bracket of 18 to sort of 30-ish, <laughs> um, then just drop into the chat now, stay in touch, and, and we can put you in touch directly with Olivia. So that was lovely. Well done, Olivia. Thank you. So moving on now, we welcome Grace Gregory and Adam Jones to our webinar. So there, as mentioned, there are NF2 Biosolutions UK funded PhD students in Manchester. So they will now help us to understand the role of inflammation in NF2 tumours and how controlling inflammation can benefit extended quality of life and how they are looking at ways to do this. But then into NF2 tumours growing in, in nerves in such small spaces, controlling the size of the tumours is very important. So this is very, very important work and it'll be interesting to learn a um, bit more today about how they're going to do that. So over to you, Grace and Adam, very much looking forward to it. Thank you so much, Claire, for the introduction. And thank you so much, Olivia, for advocating for yourself and setting up that group so that everyone can join in. I think it's a really important thing. Um, so I'm Grace, uh, nice to meet you all. I am, as, as like Adam, a second year PhD student funded by NFT Biosolutions UK and Europe. And uh, like Claire beautifully introduced, we're going to be talking to you today about our project. So I'll just share my screen with you all today. And if I can have a nod from you, Claire, if you can see it. Excellent, no technical difficulties so far. Um, great. So, um, so I'm going to start off today, um, but I'll be passing the mic backwards and forwards to Adam as we go through this presentation. So uh, I will just put on my pointer. Here we go, as we go through this presentation. So the title of our talk today is what is inflammation and how does it affect tumour growth in NF2? First of all, let's just introduce you to the rest of the researchers that are on our team. So across the top, we have our four PhD supervisors, David Broth, Omar Pathmanabhan, Kevin Cooper and Pavel Pazek. And then we have myself and Adam, the second year PhD students. We also have uh, newly joined in Kevin Cooper's lab, uh, a new PhD student in her first year working on vestibular schwannoma, Miriam. And we also have a postdoc um, in Kevin's lab that, um, called Michael Haley that helps us a lot with the computational uh, workings of our project. So let's start by um, outlining all the questions we aim to answer in this webinar today. So the first is uh, quite simply, what is inflammation? So I'm hoping that we can describe this in a non-NF2 context and then move on to question two, what does inflammation look like inside NF2 tumours and why is this important? And then this will lead us into number three. Um, is inflammation in NF2 different to non-NF2 tumours? Um, and finishing with the last two, what treatments might be useful to alter this inflammation? And finally, how can you get involved? Let's start with question number one. What is inflammation? 
So uh, just a little bit of uh, vocab whilst uh, before we fully get started. Today we'll be using the term vestibular schwannoma. Um, this has previously been known as acoustic neuroma, but we are going to be using the term vestibular schwannoma today. So let's start with what is inflammation in general. So inflammation um, occurs when your body's immune cells move to a site of damage or infection. This might be in the case where you have uh, fallen off your bike, for example, and cut your knee. Um, you often see that it might get red and swollen, and that's where your body's immune cells move to the site of damage. So immune cells usually function to destroy bacteria or viruses and then promote a healing response. Um, and this is a very good thing because this prevents um, systemic infections, for example, preventing bacteria um, from getting a grip um, in the place of damage. However, if immune cells invade into a tumour, they can actually cause more harm than good. So let's first describe um, what um, these immune cells look like in our blood, for example. So in our blood, we have um, red blood cells, and those are the ones that carry oxygen around our bodies. But we also have white blood cells, um, and these are also called immune cells. And we have lots of different types of immune cells in our bodies. And um, in a person with a vestibular schwannoma, for example, these immune cells are actually recruited into the tumour and infiltrate uh, to the site of damage. So when this happens, it can actually cause the vestibular schwannoma to grow. And uh, this is because immune cells have been linked with uh, increased vestibular schwannoma growth. So let's look at this in a bit more detail. Um, what actually are these immune cells and what are they trying to do in these tumours. So today we're going to focus on two main types of immune cells and these include T cells and you can see this uh, on the left hand side in yellow and also macrophages on the right hand side in green. So T cells can really be summarised as the kind of assassins of the immune system and their role is to find infected cells, abnormal cells, so for example, tumor cells, and actually cause them to, um, to die. So what it does is T cells combine to abnormal cells and then trigger this cell death. And this causes the um, infected cells or abnormal cells to shrink up into easily digestible little parcels. And what we can see here is that these parcels of dead cells are actually engulfed by macrophages. So the macrophages, um, their main role to summarize that is more of a cleanup through. They're moving through the tissue, um, engulfing any dead cells and debris that they come across. And once they find these dead cells and uh, kind of debris, they can actually uh, release inflammatory molecules to signal to other um, immune cells, for example, back to T cells, to actually recruit them to the site where they found these dead cells. So this is a, 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 an ongoing cycle um, of how the immune system is tackling these abnormal cells. So that's what happens um, in uh, inflammation in the general immune system. But what does inflammation look like inside NF2 tumors and why is this important? And for that, I will be handing over to Adam for this section. Lovely, thank you, Grace. So. Inflammation in tumours, as Grace has already alluded to, is quite different to what normal inflammation should be around the body, as the main function of, for example, T cells is to actually eradicate tumours, but clearly something has gone wrong with that process. So how can we look at that? So essentially, when tumours get removed from surgery, these can be then prepared and essentially packaged in a way that is easy for us to look at. So essentially we can have these sectioned and put on slides and then we can look at these under the microscope, um, which is exactly what me and Grace do. Um, and we then assess using um, something called antibodies, which essentially are these little proteins that you can tag lots of different things in the tissue with that allow us to visualize all the different immune cells, tumor cells, as well as the surrounding supporting cells. So essentially, this allows us to get a really good idea of how cells orientate within the tumours. Um, and that's just kind of a little schematic there of how it looks and what we can kind of see. So if you can go to the next slide, Grace. 
So this here is what we would call a immunohistochemistry stain. Um, and in red, you can see a marker for macrophages, which are one of the most abundant immune cells present in vestibular schwannoma, for example. Um, and then you can also see in the blue, the other cells that aren't stained. So for example, a lot of those will be tumor cells. And this is a very <clears throat> basic imaging um, form that we can get a little bit of inflama uh, information, but it doesn't give us a whole lot. And that's why we use more advanced techniques to get more in-depth profiling of the tumor. But as you can see, you can see macrophages, for example, around blood vessels, which are um, these kind of very circular and long, you can see them packed with red blood cells. Um, and there's also areas of the tumor where you can see there's no macrophages at all. So it's not that these tumors are just one big splodge of a mess. They actually are really well organized, similar to a lot of organs in the body. So this is something we're investigating in, into how these tumors form into these specific um, cellular compositions and what that means for tumor growth. Uh, so you can go on to the next slide, Grace. So as I alluded to earlier, if we use more advanced staining methods, so we use something called the Hyperion, which is a technology that essentially allows us to not just look at one marker, but we can look up to up to over 40 markers. So that really allows us to pick out all the different cell types of immune cells, as far as um, different types of um, vasculature or blood vessels and different tumor, type, uh, tumor cell types. So you can see in green, we have T cells, and then you can see these interacting with um, macrophages where you see the overlap with the yellow there. Um, yeah, there we go, nice little zoom in. Um, so interactions between T cells and macrophages in tumors can be thought to have um, a negative effect on anti-tumor immune responses as macrophages they can have a really good function in terms of an infection, but in the tumor, they can be shown to actually provide the tumor with more nutrition and actually suppress um, good immune responses against the tumor. So these are kind of things we're investigating and trying to understand what does that mean for NF2 and vestibular schwannoma. Um, and then if you can go to the next slide, Grace. So essentially what are thanks to um, Michael Haley, our postdoc, he's developed this pipeline where we can actually identify all different flavors of these immune cells and see how they organize within the tumor. And then we can get almost a map of how these immune cells relate in the tissue all through different crazy complicated computational algorithms. But the output data is gonna be absolutely phenomenal in terms of Translational, translational targets for NF2 and vestibular schwannoma. So we're very excited to see what comes out of the data. Uh, if you can go to the next one. But basically what I wanna to stress to you is why it's important to look at the spatial organization of tumor inflammation. So previously before we had all these um, really novel imaging techniques, a lot of people would just presume that tumors are just random messes of cells People didn't even think there was immune cells in these tumors at one point, probably they just thought it was like a big mess of tumor cells. But actually, as I said earlier, that is not the case at all. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So what we actually know is these tumors are highly organized and they form specific neighborhoods of different cell types. So as you can see here, I've got pro-inflammatory pro and anti-inflammatory macrophages where I kind of allude to like, you know, pro-inflammatory being good macrophages and maybe anti-inflammatory being bad. Um, for anti-tumor responses, but good for the tumor. Um, and these can form various different um, neighborhoods in the tumor. So this um, image to the right is a Hyperion image that we did, uh, I think, gosh, maybe a year ago now. Um, and essentially this shows, you can see a very drastic change in the very barren, just blue area where all you can see is tumor cells compared to the area right next to it which is full of T cells, macrophages, and all sorts of different immune cells. So these tumors are really not just messes of tumors, they are very highly organized. And understanding that has a lot of impact for how we think about drug targets for these tumors. We can go on to the next slide. So essentially, 
there can be different consequences for different um, way things organize in the tumor. For example, T cells can be trapped in parts of the tumor where they can't actually find tumor cells by macrophages, for example. Um, and essentially, these T cells just end up being stuck in these macrophage areas and they can't do anything. Whereas macrophages can also have another function in these tumors. So if they can localize themselves around blood vessels, they can actually encourage more blood vessel formation, which can not only mean there's more routes for immune cell infiltration to happen, which can mean more macrophages and more growth, but also more um, blood vessels means more nutrients for these tumors to grow. So these are all things we're looking at, and these have been targeted in other tumors, but what we want to understand is how can we target these in vestibular schwannoma and NF2. Uh, and the next slide. So now, Grace, I'm going to hand back to you to talk about the differences in NF2 tumors and non-F2 tumors. Thanks, Adam. So um, as we know, people with NF2 can form uh, multiple different types of tumours, vestibular schwannoma being one type, but also meningioma and ependymoma. Um, but NF2 um, tumours can also form in people without NF2. So vestibular schwannoma, uh, meningioma and ependymoma can occur in people without NF2, um, which is far more common. But they only get one tumour and usually just one type of tumour. For example, just um, vestibular schwannoma on one side, known as unilateral VX, um, and also they have an older age of onset. So there are some clinical differences and also biological differences um, between people with NF2 and um, sporadic patients, for example, those that don't have NF2 but still have um, a, an NF2-related um, tumour, for instance. So, as we said before, we can use the Hyperion to count up all of the different types of cells and how many cells are present within these tumours. So in NF2 um, vestibular schwannoma, we can see that approximately 50%, about half um, of these tumours are made up of um, Schwann cells, which are the tumour cells that we um, that are more traditionally associated with these VS. But also from this Hyperion work and imaging work, we found that about a third of these, um, a third of the tumor is made up of macrophages, those um, clean up crew immune cells. And um, in much smaller amounts, but still very important, nonetheless, are the T cells, the assassins. Um, and we can see here vascular about 3%. Now, what we can see when we compare this against sporadic BS, um, vestibular schwannoma in those without NF2, again, we see very, very similar proportions of all of these different um, components of these tumors. And they had uh, no significant differences between the amount of immune cells present, such as macrophages and T cells between NF2 and sporadic vestibular schwannoma. So what we can see here is by the number, there doesn't seem to be much different at all, but like Adam said, the organization of these cells is very important. So what we wanted to do was have a look at these images more uh, in more detail. And what we can actually see here is that sporadic VS have these niches um, of diffuse, um, diffuse macrophage infiltration, but also macrophages that are clustered around these blood vessels. And like in NF2, we see that as well. So these clustered niches of macrophages around vessels and diffuse infiltration of macrophages. So what we're seeing here is both um, visually and by the numbers, no um, major differences between NF2 and sporadic vestibular schwannoma. But why is this really exciting and quite important? Well, um, because more common sporadic samples might be able to be used in the lab to investigate NF2 vestibular schwannoma treatment. So if we can use the more common and more readily available sporadic VS samples in the lab um, to then translate that to NF2, that's a really big bonus um, for us as researchers. But also clinical trials might be able to co-recruit NF2 VS um, and sporadic VS um, for any potential drug trials. So anyone with uh, people with NF2 or sporadic VS might be able to be co-recruited into the same um, clinical trial. And finally, immunotherapeutics that might be um, beneficial in one group, um, for example, those with sporadic VS, 
and um, also NF2 vestibular schwannoma may, may work effectively, uh, equally effective in both groups. So that brings us on to the next point. As I mentioned, um, maybe immunotherapeutics might be effective for those with NF2. So how can we then translate that into a potential treatment? And for that, I'll hand over to Adam. Thank you, Grace. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you now a little bit about how we can translate some of this work potentially into treatments, which is the most exciting part of all this. So if you can go to the next slide. So there's kind of two routes when it comes to finding a new drug. So there's the fully novel new drug discovery where we find a completely new target and then that has to go through various different iterations of making a compound, then it has to go through the preclinical like mouse models or cell lines, for example, see if it shows um, efficacy. Then it has to go into the clinical development where we go through various different phases in humans to make sure that it's safe, effective, and that it also can be used long-term because a lot of drugs can have um, associated toxicity. Um, and then only then can it potentially go through to regulated approval. So as you can imagine, that is actually a very, very long and odious task. And this is kind of one of the um, bottlenecks of finding new drugs for um, these kind of these um, conditions. However, if we can actually repurpose drugs that are already being used for a different condition, um, whether it's a different tumor or a completely different disease altogether, like an autoimmune condition, for example, then that makes the whole process a lot quicker because that means then we only have to focus on these last three um, stages, such as is the drug effective at treating the disease and how is it um, tolerated long term? So this is something that we are most interested in. And thankfully, a lot of the um, targets we're kind of looking at already have established drugs in various different conditions. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So in terms of new treatments, understanding how immune cells and tumor cells interact in these NF2 tumors highlights new opportunities to target them therapeutically. So I'm going to talk to you today about targeting both macrophages and T cells. So as we know, macrophages play a key role in promoting tumor growth. So how can we maybe remove them from the tumor? And likewise, T cells, they have an inherent ability to be able to actually kill these tumor cells, but they've lost that. So how can we restore this function? Uh, next slide, thank you. So targeting macrophages to greatly reduce their numbers in these tumors uh, has the potential to reduce tumor growth, but also, as I said earlier, support other immune responses, such as T cell ones. Um, so for example, as in the schematic here, if we use a drug that depletes macrophages and essentially whittle their numbers down um, greatly, we can hopefully reduce bad inflammation, so one that promotes tumor growth, and hopefully that will limit tumor growth and targeting um, macrophages in VS and NF2 is being explored in uh, animal models at the moment. So hopefully this will come up with something really promising soon. Uh, and then next slide. So a lot of uh, my work focuses on T cells. Um, and if I don't ask me, T cells are my favorite immune cell and I will champion them till the end. Um, and this is because they've been used in um, T cell enhancing therapies have had a lot of success in many other tumors. So for example, melanoma, colorectal, um, lung, I could list off so many other ones, um, where the, we're using immune checkpoint blockade, which is essentially where inhibitory receptors, which are very commonly expressed on T cells in tumors, we block those with a drug and that essentially enhances and restores the T cell function. And then it can then act, uh, it can recognize the tumor cell and kill that cell, as a Grace uh, mentioned earlier. So the whole point of this immune checkpoint blockade is re-energizing and essentially taking off the break on the immune response in these tumors. And we are currently assessing in the lab which um, inhibitory molecules on these T cells are gonna be the best to target for NF2. Um, so hopefully we'll have that data in the coming month slash year. Um, next slide. 
Um, so another sort of way of utilizing T cells is something called adoptive T cell therapy. So this is essentially where we can take T cells from an individual who has NF2 and we can extract these either from the tumor or the blood. We can grow these and enhance them in the lab and then we can reintroduce them into the individual and they can locate and kill the tumor. So this has a lot of potential it's been used um, in, for example, um, B cell lymphoma. Um, and essentially this would mean if someone, for example, with NF2 had one of their tumors removed, um, but there's a likelihood of a tumor on the other vestibular nerve growing, we could potentially use those T cells, enhance them in the lab, put them back in, and hopefully it prevent the need for that tumor to have to be surgically removed. Um, so this is kind of another route that we're exploring um, here in Manchester, and we hope that this is also gonna be another novel uh, therapeutic that can be utilized. Uh, and the next slide. And yeah, and I will pass back to Grace to talk about how you can get involved. Thanks, Adam. Um, yeah, just the last final point to our presentation is how can you get involved with this kind of work? So um, if you yourself have NF2, um, we're always keen to hear your story on our NF2 Biosolutions blog. Just as Olivia mentioned, by sharing these experiences and reading about other people's experiences, it really creates a sense of community for those with NF2. Um, so you can email Joanne at nf2biosolutions.org to share your story or just to get an idea of what kind of a blog post um, might be good for you to, to put out there. But also to help support research, you could talk to your clinical team about donating tumours, um, MRI scans and blood to research. Um, and this would be very beneficial to researchers like myself and Adam, who are always looking for um, samples that we can try and pull the most information out of um, and really um, bring forward new therapeutics um, to, to help those with NF2. So also, if you yourself um, are a friend or a family member um, of someone who has NF2, Again, you could contact Joe um, or head over to the blog for potential fundraising ideas if you want to help um, boost funding for research. So again, you can email Joe or you can um, look out for our um, blog on the um, NF2 Biosolutions website. Um, and you can also check out NF2 Biosolutions on social media um, for stories and updates on our research, but also um, uh, what else is going on in the fundraising community. And finally, if you're an NF2 researcher or clinician, please feel free to um, connect and collaborate with us here at Manchester. You can contact me at nf2biosolutions.org um, and then that will be able, we'll be able to um, work out what best way forward we can collaborate together. And that will be a, a really exciting thing. As we know, um, the NF2 research environment is a very collaborative environment and is always looking for potential connections. So um, you can also discuss regular blood or tumour biobanking with your team at your institution or um, potentially directly with us, um, just so we make sure that we make the most of these really valuable samples so that we can then push, um, push forward NF2 research. But finally, um, as you can see at the bottom here, we can also that we are NF2 aware. And this is part of the campaign that Joe has been running on social media at the moment. Um, so let's just show the world um, that there are many faces that know NF2 and that we are stronger together against NF2. So thank you so much for, um, for having us on this um, webinar today and we're quite happy to take questions now so um, I will stop sharing with you now. Great, thanks very much. Thank you Grace and Adam, thank you so much. That was really informative and very easy for me to understand who's non-medical and I'm sure lots of the people that are watching are non-medical and I hope you understood too. It's very, very self-explanatory. So thank you very, very much for explaining to that, that to us so well. Thank you so much for your hard work and for being so invested in us as an NF2 family. You certainly have become part of our family and we hope to uh, keep you <laughs> after this PhD is done. We'll have to see what we can do there. But um, as Grace said, it's very important to keep this work going. We really need help from everybody that's thinking of having an operation coming up and speak to your clinicians and ask them to have your NF2 tumours donated. 
Um, yet we need all of the samples we can get our hands on to keep pushing this work forward. So the samples are really, really important. And of course, the fundraising is as well. The two things go hand in hand. And then what we do is we do all the money goes directly through in the UK to this particular project at the moment, every single penny, because we're all volunteers. So this is what you're driving. So it's really, really exciting. And I think a lot of you will know Joanne Ward. She's an NF2 patient. She does all of our marketing and social media. And so you've got her email there. You can contact her directly. You can contact me. You can contact Olivia, Grace, Adam, Jules, everybody on here. Um, or just pop a note, stay in touch in the chat so that we can uh, connect with you. So let's have a look at some questions that have come in for Grace and Adam. So I've got one here. Um, and you may have covered this a little bit, Grace. Um, it says, do you think the inflammation work you're doing is applicable to all three NF2 tumour types? Yeah, well, myself and Adam can answer that. Adam, did you want to chip in with this one? Yeah. Uh, so I think the principles of what we do is almost inherently applicable to any tumour. Um, it's very discovery based. And I think every tumour has an immunological landscape to it. So absolutely applicable to other NFT tumour types such as meningioma and ependymoma. Um, the only thing that we'd need to do is actually conduct these investigations in them as well. So we are going to be getting meningioma samples in the very near future and doing very, very similar investigations in that. And hopefully in the future, whether it's us or someone else can do this in a pendulum as well. And who knows, maybe we'll find something common between all three that will um, be useful for treating all three tumours, which would obviously be the absolute best case scenario. Yeah. Of course. So lots of people recognise vestibular schwannoma. They're the tumours that people then have to have in their ears, but not many people recognise meningioma and even rarer is ependymoma. So this might be news for some people that there, there are two other tumours kicking about, but um, rest assured, the work that you're doing can look at inflammation in all three, is that correct? Absolutely. Great. Um, so I've got another question here. Um, it says, uh, we're suggesting that inflammation may lead to hearing loss as well as tumour growth. Why might that be happening? So why would inflammation be causing hearing loss and tumour growth? So like we've mentioned before, these immune cells have uh, lots of different um, different activities um, and in different roles. So when we can see um, in the tumour, they might promote growth, but we can also uh, macrophages in other locations, for example, in the inner ear, in the cochlea, um, might be releasing these inflammatory molecules that are used to signal for, to other immune cells and actually might be causing damage to their hair cells, the cells that are actually important for hearing and that conduct the noise um, and then take that signal to the brain. So if we lose the ability um, of these hair cells to conduct the noise, then that's one reason why there might be hearing loss. So a potential um, therapeutic for this might be to actually inhibit these inflammatory molecules in the ear to then re um, reduce the damage that's done to these hair cells. So that might be, in addition to um, the inflammation that's important in these tumours, that might be an answer to why inflammation might be playing a role in hearing loss. Lovely. Thank you, Grace. Um, so next question here, um, you spoke about um, immuno immunotherapeutic there tools. Um, so these tools in humans, um, how close are we to, for using these kind of tools in humans? So immunotherapies are already widely used in lots of different, not just tumours, but are being used for autoimmune conditions, they're being used for various different infectious conditions like malaria, for example. So we're at the precipice of them potentially being used in NF2 as well. We just need to find the most effective targets that can be used in NF2. So I wouldn't say we're far out at all, and that's very exciting. 
Yeah, very, thank you. Um, so now next question. A uh, patient here has had hearing loss for nearly 20 years and is profoundly deaf. With the new drugs, will they potentially restore any of the hearing or does that depend on other factors? For example, um, a cochlear implant didn't work in this particular patient. So do you think the new drugs could potentially restore hearing if hearing has been lost and then perhaps the tumour has reduced in size because the inflammation has reduced? That's a great question. Um, it's hard to tell because like I said, these um, different treatments have never been tried in people with NF2, but in other conditions um, for, um, that may cause hearing loss that are not tumour induced, but for example, auto-inflammatory reduced, um, um, induced, there's been evidence of these um, signaling molecule inhibitors actually restoring some level of hearing from um, people that have had hearing loss. So in other conditions, yes, it has been seen, but again, these aren't tumour induced hearing loss um, um, forms. So it's just something we're going to have to, to test um, in people with NF2 and in potential hearing loss mouse models, just to be um, just to see the effects, whether it will just um, prevent further hearing loss or whether it can restore some some level of hearing. But it's something that we'll need to be looking into. OK, thank you. Um, questions are flooding in here. I'm trying to keep up with them all. Um, so we know um, usually with sudden hearing loss, the doctors and our clinicians suggest that we should get some steroids very quickly. And that's, we understand, to curb inflammation. So, you know, that's a similar role to stop the body's reaction to the tumour growth that's happened. So do you think that the new drugs would mean that we wouldn't need to do that? Or is that something completely different, do you think? And, and long term, is there still a place for steroids, do you think, in your opinion? So I think this is probably getting a bit deep into sort of medical management and treatment of NF2 here. But um, steroids and, and the drugs perhaps that will release for inflammation, hopefully, fingers crossed. What's the difference there, please, Adam or Grace? Yeah, I can try and answer this. Again, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a doctor, um, academic researcher, but um, steroids may have still have a role for immediate use, for example, whereas these anti-inflammatory drugs or these um, signaling molecule inhibitor drugs might be a more long-term drug to prevent inflammation in the long term, whereas steroids might be more of an initial um, fast acting. Uh, anti-inflammatory agent but I think as with most drugs and what myself and Adam are finding the more we dig in the literature and in our own research is that combinations of drugs are really likely to be the way forward it's not just going to be um, like a one-hit wonder it might be really depends on the person but also uh, the type of inflammation that might be happening so I think like we said um, with Adam for example explaining that reducing macrophages whilst boosting T cells um, would be a beneficial way forward, that would require two different um, drug agents. So actually, I think we're always gonna be looking at things in comb combination, especially when we also think about the fact that lots of people with NF2 are on Avastin. So whatever um, different therapeutic agents that we're looking at for future use are going to have to be um, semi-compatible at least with um, Avastin. So like I said, um, the use of steroids will probably still happen alongside whatever new new agents we're, we're planning to use. Thank you. I think that's becoming clearer and clearer that there perhaps won't be a you know one answer, but there'll be a combination of answers to slow down the progression. That's what we're pushing for. Um, because at the moment, we can be reactive, can't we? And we can remove a tumour and cause some damage, or we have to wait for the tumour to grow to cause the damage. So I think it's a way of slowing the process down. There might be more than one, ways of, one way of doing that. So I think we're, we're, we're all understanding that. And um, so next question here. Um, 
Can patients try potential treatments that have not passed all stages of testing? So if patients are aware of risks and they want to take um, a drug, can they do this? So there is something called off-label use of drugs. So for example, people treated with Avastin for NF2, that's off-label use because it's not FDA approved yet. Um, that's something you can discuss with your clinical management team. Um, it'll honestly depend on, I guess, the data from the research and preclinical stuff that supports it being effective, um, as well as how safe we think the drug is to use, because there's a lot of good drugs out there, but they also have some proper nasty side effects. So you really want to manage trying to make someone better, but also not making someone ill at the same time. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be completely dependent on the, the person's specific incidents as well. If they've got potentially extremely rapid progressing tumour, maybe it's worth a shot, but also the safety has to be absolutely considered. But the clinical team who manage that will absolutely be on top of that. So would it be uh, fair to say, because we're repurposing drugs in this instance uh -huh. that those drugs would have already been tested and safe to market so we are in we have a faster route to market as such with this particular project would that be fair to say i'd say it's fair to say yeah so repurpose repurposing of drugs these are drugs that have already gone through all the safety so they'll be deemed safe for use in human um, the thing will be that needs to be properly rigorously tested is how effective are they at either halting tumour growth or even causing tumour shrinkage. And then the other thing is how well is the drug tolerated long term in these um, people as well. But all that going well, there's a new treatment there. So this is definitely a lot quicker than just finding a new target, a drug being developed and the hands go for the whole shebang of safety, yeah. Okay, so people are now asking um, of how they can manage inflammation or can they manage inflammation to this level with their own diet? What would you say to that? So in terms of diet, there's some evidence that, for example, certain bacteria you can have in your stomach influence how your immune response works over your body. So a lot of work in Manchester actually focuses on how your gut bacteria influence your immune system and that role that has in different inflammatory diseases. Um, so there is a link actually between your diet and your immune system. The extent of how well you can alter your diet to um, stop tumours growing I don't know um, but there is no harm in having a bioactive yogurt every now and again which helps promote your gut health but in terms of diet it's very hard to say about the proper clinical evidence to support um, that kind of control of the tumour. Okay, thank you. We had specifically, uh, we were specifically asked about turmeric and black pepper. So um, you probably can't say about those, but um, they they were in in the notes there. But I think it's definitely worth asking your doctors and your dietitians for advice there. I think. Um, we have some other questions that that are a bit more. Um, a bit more off this particular topic, but one of them is um, which therapy, in your opinion, do you think is most viable? Because people have heard about um, tumour infiltrating lymphocytes that we're hoping to kickstart one of our projects, uh, um, NF2 Biosolutions UK. That project hasn't quite started yet, but we're hoping to do that with the Manchester team. So between um, the TEALS project, T-cells project, inflammation project, and other things like CRISPR that we hear of um, in, in our circles, in our NF2 circles, in your opinion, which one do you think would be quicker to get to patients? Which one's showing most promise at the moment? 
yours, I suppose. <laughs> um, so I think when we've discussed this at um, the conference in LA in January, uh, one of the really exciting projects was Gary Brennan's project. And I mean, Gilles knows a lot about Gary Brennan's project, but that's a very a project that's quite far ahead. And that is um, injecting um, a dead form or attenuated form of bacteria into the tumour to, to kind of kickstart this anti-tumour effect um, uh, to reduce tumour growth. But I actually, I and I think that's really exciting work and it really links into what we're interested in, in terms of harnessing the immune system to um, combat these tumours. Um, I think as far as our projects go, um, a lot of our potential drugs that would be um, coming out of these projects, like we've said, are already out there. So that means that if we can identify something that's interesting and then test it in a mouse model, for example, then the turnaround for that will be um, quick because it's not a novel drug discovery from the, the, bare, the basics, because as we said, it has already been through a rigorous testing process in other diseases. Um, so, I mean, the right answer for me is our project is gonna go great, um, but we'll have to see. And I think um, with the ever growing team in Manchester, it just goes to show um, how um, the, the expertise that we have at the moment is ever expanding and this is helping us and our supervisors apply for larger and larger grants that will continue um, this amazing information work at Manchester, um, hopefully until we find something that's very tangible and out there for everyone to use. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. And just one last point that you may not know the answer to. It's quite specific. So some patients are being asked to donate blood um, in clinics, like in some of our satellite clinics in Cambridge, for example, and they're being told it's going to the Rare Disease Research Bank. So they wanted to highlight that to you to see if you can access those samples and, and if you knew about them. So I'm just going to leave that with you and see whether that's something that you can yep. look into yep. perhaps to help with our research. Definitely. Um, I'm currently looking into a potential blood study. So I am actually in contact with the Cambridge Centre um, and we have a meeting coming up just to discuss what's needed to access the samples, all the endless amount of paperwork that goes with this kind of thing mm. um, as we find ourselves wading through a lot of paperwork. Um, myself and yeah. Adam. Um, so it really is how to, it's going to be how to make the most of what's there and what we, we have access to. But yeah, thank you so much for highlighting that. Always a great thing um, to make a note of where you have donated um, any samples, any blood to, so that you know exactly where it is if um, anyone is interested in using potential uh, samples like that. So thank you so much for highlighting that. That's great. And also always give permission and sign a form if you're a patient uh, donating anything anywhere, <laughs> because that helps everybody out. Right. We're coming to the end now, I'm afraid. So we're just going to flash up a poll so that you can give us some feedback. So, Rebecca, if you wouldn't mind just bringing the poll up for us and then we can get some feedback from our audience on today, which should be really, really useful. So please take some time just to pop um your comments there on our on our webinar feedback. That'd be brilliant. There's only three questions, so you can just really quickly pop that in. And then um, I think we will then have the poll results flashing up on your screens, as I understand it. Yes, people are still answering right now. Great. Uh, some people are having trouble pressing submit on the poll I've got here. Um, so I'm not sure whether that's going to complete or not. So far we have 20 people that answered. Oh, great. Okay, lovely. Let's give that a second. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, I think uh, it's we had two, 22 people answered. Great. Okay. I'm not sure if the results are good. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. So um, that's great feedback for us. So thank you very much to everybody that's filled out that poll. Um, that's lovely. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. So I hope that was useful to you too. Um, so that's us. We've run out of time. All goes, re goes really, really quickly when we have such an interesting topic like this to talk about. Um, so many, many thanks to Gilles, to Olivia, to Grace and Adam for their time today. And thank you everybody for watching and for joining and for your answers and for being so interactive. Um, don't forget to stay in touch with us. It's still time to put that in the chat. If you want to donate to our NF2 fundraiser today, um, just look on your social media, we're all over it. <laughs> um, so you can do that if you want to hold an event, we can help you, we really can help you, give you some ideas, we can support you and give you all the tools you need to hold an event. Um, as you know, we're patient led and we really rely on your support. So yeah. um, thank you all very much for keeping us strong and fighting and filled with hope. And we'll see you all again soon.